All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to semester five of West Talks. It's uh, September 23rd, 2021. Um, and this is uh, this is the kickstart of West Talks for the fall 2021-22 school year. Um, so with that, uh, welcome to new to new participants and welcome back to our previous uh, West Talks participants as well. As you would have seen, West Talks is uh, a joint collaboration between UBC Future Waters and the IC Impacts uh, Group. And we now have uh, our organizing committee. Well, I think I'll go to the next page. Organizing committee um, is uh, comprised of people from UBC here, that's where I'm from, as well as the University of Guelph with Jaskaran and the University of Victoria with Kelsey. Um, so thank you to everybody who's involved in organizing this, as well as Furia from IC Impacts and, and the team there for managing the uh, the backside of West Talks and uploading the videos afterwards. Okay, so I will, uh, I think I just shared the link in the chat box. This is our global map. This was from, I think, uh, June of this summer. Um, this is uh, where everybody had called in from. So in the chat box, I put this link. And uh, and if you can add yourself to the global map, if you haven't done already, it's, uh, it's very cool to see where in the world everybody's checking in from West Talks. We do try to bring a global audience of water experts together to share their, uh, their learnings and their experiences. Um, and that's, I think, the strength of West Talks is our diversity, cultural and academic backgrounds. So please do check in and let us know where you're calling from. All right, and with that, we're excited to announce the lineup for the 2021 fall lineup for West Talks. Um, today is September 23rd, and we have Dr. Andrew Jones from Duke. Um, this year, we decided to, um, to switch West Talks to every second week. We have them going every week, um, and we, we thought that with people back in person mostly, uh, and with other classes and seminars starting, it might be a good idea to to go to every second week. So now uh, starting this week and then every second week until Christmas and then also through January onwards, we're, uh, we're having West Talks. So uh, mark your calendars every second week. Uh, so again, today we're starting with Dr. Andrew Jones. Dr. Michael Bentel um, from Clemson will be up next. Dr. Joe Goodwill uh, talking about manganese oxidation. And we're still trying to figure out November 4th. Dr. Elon Adler from UCL is talking about rainwater harvesting. Uh, Dr. Monica Almenko from Waterloo and Dr. Alexandra Kasivi from University of Laval are the lineup for fall 2021. And today we're here. Um, as always, all the previous West Talks are available on the IC Impacts and West Talks YouTube page. So if you go to IC Impacts or if you just YouTube West Talks, we have enough hits now that if you just search West Talks, it'll come up um, in the box and all of our previous videos are there. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Lily, who will introduce today's speaker. Okay, I'm really honored uh, to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Andrew Jones. Dr. Jones joined as an assistant prof in Duke University Civil and Environmental Engineering Department in July 2021, after leading the system for engineering the environmental lab in Northeastern University chemical engineering department from 2019 to 2020. His research focuses on addressing global challenges in water and bacteria using engineering and policy analysis. He has received over 20 academic awards, including Montana State University Center for Biofilm Engineering's Young Investigator Award. He cur uh, currently serves as the PI on an NIH and IGMS R35 MIRA 5 year grant and the students under his mentorship and supervision have won research awards and gone uh, onto medical school, graduate school, and start companies. He received his PhD, Master of Science, and Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, and a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from MIT with a focus on transport phenomena and environmental engineering. He completed a postdoctoral fellow study at Northeastern University as a future faculty fellow. And with that, I would like to hand this over to Dr. Jones. And if you have any questions, please post it on the chat box and I will get and moderate the questions at the end for 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answer session. Okay, Andrew. All right, thank you very much, Lily. Um, so I will share my screen and get started. Yeah. My screen is. Okay. Can everybody see the uh, presentation? Good. Yep. Okay. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about bacteria transport, um, specifically bacteria biofilm structure as a metabolic response to stress. Um, so this work 
is mostly covering a decent chunk of my graduate work, but it, it's also beginning to lead into some of the work that we're trying to do in the lab. Um, and to start though, I just kind of want to start like who, just, just think about kind of childhood experiences and what kind of led you to engineering. This right here is really what led me to engineering, um, environmental engineering specifically, uh, right? Watching the show Captain Planet, it was part of the edutainment movement uh, that happened within the United States between 1990, 92, as well as between 1993 and 96, right? Like edutainment, as we think about like science communication as West Talks, I know is pushing forward science communication um, through this wonderful lecture series that's been going on for a year and a half now. Uh, we're thinking about how to really motivate the next generation and how to, especially from an environmental side, if we're thinking about water, we're really trying to push people towards saving and conserving the planet so that we can continue for future generations. So that's how I came into this space. Um, that's also why my lab is, or at least has been in the past, largely staffed by undergrads is because the power is really yours. It's, it's supposed to be handing off to the next generations to really take care of this place. Um, so that's my, that has been my lab. That's been my motivation to really lead, link you into kind of how that all ties together. Um, my lab is, works on around five different projects at any given moment. So one is a project on looking at how a water smart grid can help unite the nation's uh, SDG six. So the goal for water. Um, so really looking at that from an equity standpoint as we create new technologies. So the um, piece on the left-hand side, microfluidic generation and storage of acids um, that project was led by an undergrad. Uh, she actually was able to receive partial, I guess she's 50% on a patent with me on that project. Um, so, um, and that sensor will hopefully be integrated into a smart grid. And will, will that actually produce an equity situation is what um, Slater Payne was working on. So that's kind of how to, how to really see the technologies as engineers transform into a way that's going to help people. Um, the biofilm dynamics under stress, that's a project I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, the cooperative stress response to anti-biofilm peptides, that was actually one inspired by a paper out of, um, actually, I want to say it was out of UBC, uh, Bob Hancock's group. Um, but also it was really initiated by an undergrad. She was reading through that paper and came up with a lot of really good questions. So when we think about trying to inspire future leaders, when we think about trying to communicate science, um, like the they can ask important questions that need really good answers. Um, undergrads have been really transformative in the way my lab works um, just because of how they see the world. Uh, so specifically, I wanna talk about this biofilm community dynamics and porous media under shear stress and chemical stress. Uh, the problem is that bacteria and in, in water filters um, trapped inside water filters become chlorine and chloroamine tolerant. So that was work done out of um, Amit Pinto, who's a PhD in 2012. Um, he's later continued that as part of the water microbe um, group at Northeastern and now at Georgia Tech. Um, and that's a problem. Um, if we chlorinate our waters to we remove bacteria, but we're creating chlorine and chloroamine tolerant bacteria inside drinking water filters, that's going to be problematic. So what we're trying to do is create a deterministic community of E. coli, Pseudomonas, and Legionella, test those in a drinking water filter and determine how different shear rates and different end stage protein, uh, different shear rates affect their growth, different shear rates affect their um, community populations, um, and as well as different uh, chemical stresses will affect those. And so the research that I'm going to talk about from this point forward is really going to be addressing or talking about how shear stress impacts a single species of biofilm. Um, and so you'll be able to kind of see how that ties in and how that was able to inspire this work. Um, so the work, this work was really inspired by, again, a lot of inspiration here. Um, history is important. Um, so this was inspired by um, the concept of a microbial fuel cell. So microbial fuel cells uh, modeled after, let's say, an upflow anaerobic digester. If you're in the wastewater side of the world, um, you'll Kind of have an idea of what an upflow anaerobic digester is. You have fixed, you have floating media or fixed media. You run your wastewater up through it. Your bacteria grab onto that and they will start consuming it. They will both sit on the media so they can grow, grow thick biofilms, and then they will also consume things around it. So that's the way that those work. The microbial fuel cell modeled after it looks pretty similar, um, and it functions very, fairly similarly, where your bacteria are sitting at the porous anode, so the porous carbon anode, um, and they're seeing the influent. And then you just kind of run that up and through. Now, what a microbial fuel cell typically is, 
is similar to a standard fuel cell. Um, so your standard hydrogen oxygen fuel cell, when people talk about fuel cell power cars, they're talking about um, taking oxygen on one side, oxidizing that or reducing that with an electron and combining that with hydrogen to produce water on one side. And then they're talking about splitting hydrogen on the left-hand side. Um, here in a microbial fuel cell, we don't split hydrogen. We instead feed glucose or any other carbohydrate to a bacterium. They spit out CO2, similar to the way we do actually, and as well as protons and electrons. Um, the specific bacteria that we're working with are able to really respire on electrodes as opposed to breathe onto what we do, which is we breathe onto oxygen um, or what a lot of other species do, which they'll breathe onto a soluble metal. Um, this bacteria that we really focus on is uh, Geobacter sulfuroreducens. It does it really well. Um, typically, it does it in the, the image on the bottom left is where it is reducing iron oxide in, in river water sediment. Um, it looks like that under a TEM colorized. The blue and the red lines, those are the potentially conductive pili that are actually having the electron transport happen. Uh, there are a couple other hypotheses as to how the electron transport happens between the bacterium, the inside of the bacterium, and outside the bacteria. But for right now, you can just say that they do it very well. They are able to transport electrons pretty well from inside their membrane to outside their membrane. Um, They form very thick biofilms. So the image on the left-hand side, the top left is an image out of my lab um, where it was growing on this carbon cloth that you'll see on the right-hand side anode. So it was growing on a basically a piece of fabric that was made out of carbon. And most of that's all bacteria. Um, you, you'll see that all the fibers, except that one exposed fiber is bacteria, uh, which is, which is what, what do we want? It's around 60 microns thick or so. Um, and one of the things that you want to think is, can we get really practical power out of these things, right? If, if you have a microbial fuel cell and you're comparing it to a standard fuel cell and saying, we can get energy out of wastewater, right? We can save the world by both treating wastewater and producing electricity. It's carbon neutral. We've cleaned up the drink. We've cleaned up rivers. We've cleaned up oceans. What, what type of powers are we talking about? And the image on the bottom right shows a current density out of that standard fuel cell that I've been showing earlier. Um, and you'll see that the maximum power density out of that architecture is 200 milliwatts per meter square, or squared. That number in comparison to a standard fuel cell is about an order of four smaller. So uh, we aren't getting a lot of practical power. So one of the challenges that the, this field faces, the microbial fuel cells faces, is how can we get practical power out of a microbial fuel cell? So one thing that's been identified is that fluxes across biofilm space really limit current production. That is, as you're trying to feed these bacteria your carbohydrates and have them digest and process that, those chemicals, as I said, they're producing protons, they're producing electrons, and they're producing CO2. CO2 as a gas can move pretty quickly through water. Um, protons also move pretty quickly. Um, but both CO2 and uh, your protons, your hydrogen ions, will start dropping the pH of your fluid. It'll start dropping the pH of your liquid. Um, and as it drops the pH, you wind up from the nice comfortable pH that we all like living in, pH 7, down to around pH 5.8, uh, which is not where a lot of things like living. Specifically, these bacteria don't like living down there. Um, and one thing that's been found is that the activity of those electron transport proteins, those the little purple and red lines that I was showing on that colorized SEM, TEM, um, they're a function of the local pH. So they, they start really kind of degrading as you drop the pH. Um, that was another paper out of my lab, um, out of my graduate school lab. Um, and so thinking back to that, that upflow anaerobic digester, um, all right, this, this nice tool that wastewater engineers have been using for a while, it's like, can we use forced convection to enhance power? Right. If the limit is proton transport, the limit is CO2 transport, if we just flow things past really quickly, can we really enhance the power? Um, it, ha it has some evidence in, in the past. So this is a paper from what 1982 um, on, from Trulian Terraclis, uh, one of the foundation, foundational papers on biofilms um, and on wastewater treatment, which shows that glucose removal rate increases as you increase rotational speed of a 
uh, concentric reactor. So you're increasing transport or you're increasing really the flow rate and you're increasing glucose removal rate. So that, there were some thoughts there. There were some good thoughts and some good evidence in the past. However, there's also the trade-off with that, that as you increase rotational speed, you also start losing your biomass. So your biofilm can't hold on as you're flowing past it really, really quickly, which that's, that would be a problem. That's a trade-off that we would hopefully balance as engineers, right? Most of an engineer's job is balancing two, two competing interests and trying to come up with a solution in between there. And so that, that's the hope. If we want to study that hope and see if that's actually going to be a, a true good answer, um, one way to do this is to simplify it. So to take this complex, very dynamic upflow anaerobic digester system where your media is dispersed and simplify it down to a system that is well-constrained and well-defined. So the rotating disk electrode, it can simulate real-world devices because of those two equations that I show on the bottom. Um, it has analytic solutions to the flow at the surface of the disk. So these blue lines are actual plots of the, fun the velocity as a function of radius, um, height, and um, azimuthal direction and radial direction. So you can actually just you can create a you can create that equation. Somebody did that back in 1906, um, and you can create that equation. You can plug it into a you can plug it into a computer, and you can perfectly simulate the flow of the disk. You can also simulate the shear stress of the disk. So that is the force that the bacteria will be removed at as a function of let's say the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is a dimensionless group that allows you to quantify shear stress versus or inertial versus viscous forces. So you can plot your shear stress over a function of your inertial forces. Um, as equivalent, equivalent to your Reynolds number to the negative one half is, is a nice simplified version of talking about shear stress relationships. You can also map out your flux because if you have an analytic solution to your velocity field, then you can plug that into your concentration diffusion equation and you can solve for the concentration of nutrients being flow toward the disk and therefore towards your bacterium. So th this was a really nice way of taking a complex system and mapping it down to a, a system that we can study in a little more controlled fashion. All right, so when I talk about this radial flow, this is what this looks like at the surface of the disk. So I should be able to see this flow happening at the surface of my disk and the surface of my biofilm. Um, if I wanted to match that real world system to this simplified system, what I can do is I can look up what the shear stress was on the on that porous media that they measured. Um, so they measure the shear. They can measure the shear stress. They can measure the glucose loading rate. So that is the number in um, where they have it's five point three five times ten to the minus six grams of chemical oxygen demand per centimeter squared per second. So that's how much the the system on the left hand side was being fed. Um, they also gave me a. I was able to calculate actually their shear rate and their shear stress from their flow rate through that porous media. And so being able to calculate that, I could translate that over to what the rotating disk electrode should see. And then I can just scale that down, right? So I can take those, I can take that dimensionless number, take both the flux that I have an analytic expression for, and I can say, well, if I wanna vary the shear stress from one order of magnitude and go down two orders of magnitude, so the shear stress on the left-hand side, so. 1.5, 0, 0, 0, 0.1, and 0 0.01 pascals, I know that I've set the rotation of this rotating disk at a specific RPM. And I will also create a certain shear rate, which also varies over three, two orders of magnitude, and also have a dimensionless shear. When I do that, unlike the real world system, I can also fix my mass flux, which is the one of the best things about this rotating disk electrode system is that the nutrients being delivered to the surface where I hope my bacteria are going to grow um, is the same, even though I've varied my shear rate, right? Just by varying the concentration in that flux equation that I showed you on the previous slide, um, I was able to fix the mass flux. So they're all seeing the same amount of food per, per unit area per time. After two days of continuous growth, this is what you see when you pull out that disc, that, you're hoping to grow bacteria on. So bacteria were growing and 
you can see that they're initially influenced by the flow, right? You can see that this path, this flow, this analytic expression for the fluid velocity that was created back in 1934 pretty well lines up with the way the bacteria are trying to grow. So there is some initial influence. You can also see once you start measuring current, which is their metabolic rate, right? If they're directly respiring as a function of breaking down a carbohydrate and turning that into electrons, protons, and CO2, if we're measuring the current they're spitting out, we're almost measuring their, me their metabolism. And so we're able to measure the current as a function of time. And we'll see that, yeah, the, at the highest shear rate at one Pascal, you have maximum current density. So that, that's good. That also confirmed that truly interact was 1982 work. Um, but then you really want to question that with some dimensional analysis and some other um, methods and say, well, if I look at growth kinetics, so look taking a standard Monod, Monod model for growth kinetics, that's the equation on the right-hand side. And I compare that to the maximum current that these things were supposed to output, which would be I, divided by the theoretical current that um, that they should have been able to output, which is that equation on the bottom, the N times F times A times N. I, I, would ex I can explain that if you want later. It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a relationship between current and electrons, electrons given. Then you'll see that, well, shear stress induces an increase in the, in the dimensionless growth rate, right? So if I were to flip back to this equation, K here is, a, is the growth rate. A dimensionless growth rate would be K, T, Y, Q, y, Q sub M. And you'll see that, yeah, there's really just a shift up as you increase in shear stress, right? You can look at the theoretical, you can actually calculate the theoretical time for each one of those to have reached their maximum, um, their maximum growth. And you'll see that the one Pascal case it actually lines up with what we saw. And so at around the day four-ish was when we had maximum current output. The 0.1 Pascal case, it also was able to kind of output maximum current somewhere around where we saw it. We saw it around, around day four, um, though it seems a little bit steady there. I can show that graph. Um, I'll actually show that graph in a second. And then the 0.01 Pascal case was actually beyond the time that we ran this experiment. So that was seven days. But through dimensional analysis, we could actually extract something useful from there. We were able to say that if we had waited 10 days, we might have actually seen uh, maximum growth. So that was one useful thing from just looking at growth kinetics. Uh, and also to note that the bacteria may or may not be metab most metabolically active at high shear rate, right? We really could have just shifted the growth rate up. Um, so another question to ask is, we know that trapping bacteria in electric fields is a function of their relative polarizability. What does that mean? So if you look at the image on the left, um, that's a large device with two electrodes being stuck in it. Those two electrodes create an electric field. Um, if you have an insulating plastic through a little micro channel, which is shown in the middle image, then you're actually going to create a force, an electromotive force on a particle flowing through there. And that's going to be a function of the relative polarizability between that bacterium or that particle and the media that it's in. And at a certain point, it could actually, at a certain balance, um, those particles can get stuck. Um, and so we could trap those bacteria depending on their relative polarizability. Um, we know that the charge transport proteins on these bacterium carry charge. All right, so that, 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 is, that makes sense. They're transporting electrons from inside the membrane to outside the membrane. They're carrying charge um, to reduce iron oxide. We also know that the efficiency of current transport increases with time. Um, so we're able, to measure, we're able to measure this output of current. And we're also able to see that, okay, in 20, uh, 24 days, we can trap a bacterium easier than we can the wild type. And we can trap the same geobacter sulfur reducens um, even easier at a lower voltage if we wait 31 days. And if we start knocking out some of those transport proteins, OMCS, OMCZ, OMCE, then it traps at a higher and higher voltage. It's harder to trap them. Um, and so there is some sort of a function of time at which the polarizability of these um, bacteria changes and it increases. So. When I think about this current, then that when I was saying growth rate, 
well, I know that current is not exactly equivalent to biomass because there was some efficiency in transport, right? There might, might have been an increase in the efficiency of electron transport that I was changing, not necessarily the growth rate. So back to the drawing board of our bacteria, the most metabolically active at the highest shear rate. Well, let's just, let's just pull out those three points. So that maximum that I was able to see both at day three and day four point, like roughly day three, roughly day five, um, and a little bit around day six. Uh, or day seven, really. Pulling out those maximum shear rates, I can compare that to other existing work. So this work was done at um, by Babata and Banal at the University of Washington. Um, what's the campus? Not the main, not the main U University of Washington campus in Seattle, but the one in Pullman. Um, and they use the same system, same species, same rotating disk electrode, same media. Uh, they did not fix their mass flux. Um, so you can calculate their mass flux based on the concentration of media, concentration of ingredients they're giving. So they were feeding it at, with uh, 10 millimolar of acetate. And based on that concentration, you can back calculate out their mass flux. And uh, these were the current densities that they were able to find, their maximum current densities at their given shear rates. You can plot our work along with it. And you will see that if you combine our work and their work, that it does fit this trend that we saw back in that 1982 Trillian Triaclis paper. So that, that's good. It still ties back to that original work, right? So there, there's still precedence. But if we dig into a little bit better, um, apply dimensional analysis to this, one of the running themes of this, this talk, we can plot dimensionless current versus this other number, the Schmidt number times this Reynolds number, which is a measurement of the effect of transport, the effect of shear uh, viscosity, and the effect of inertial transport. So transporting all three of those, dimensionless current versus, this is technically a share wood, the log of the share wood number. Um, what you'll see is that there's a really distinct difference in between our two systems. And that's due to the initial growth conditions. So while they had all the same conditions in the Babata and Bainal paper as we did, they actually started their work for three days at zero shear. And then they ramped up, whereas we ran it continuous at a continuous shear rate for all seven days. Right. And this produced slightly different um, transport, right? Very distinct. So if you look at acetate transport in Babaita and Bayanal's work, their, co their coefficient of alpha um, on the Schmidt number varies from negative one versus our work at one um, for the transport of acetate into it. So that might actually be the thing that is changing as far as our biofilm is concerned, right? If we look inside the biofilm, we'll know that shear stress doesn't induce changes in the outer structure, right? So this all the way out away from the electrode, these things kind of merge up. So one Pascal, 0.1 Pascal and 0.01 Pascals, they the porosity lines up. Um, whereas if you go right on the surface of the disc, you'll have very different changes, very different porosity, the closer you get to the disc. So it doesn't really change the outer structure. This is a confocal microscope image that's just kind of video that's just playing on the left-hand side. Um, but it does change what happens at the, um, at the, in the inside. All right. That the biofilm substructure, this flow pattern that I showed you in the beginning, that's very similar to the one that I'm showing here on the right-hand side, doesn't seem to be replicated on the left-hand side. All right. So the biofilm substructure seems to remember, quote unquote, remember, the initial shear stress conditions that it was put under. So the two days versus the seven days, you still see that flow pattern inside, but you don't see it outside. Um, biofilm substructures are channels that can carry fluid. Um, at least that's what some authors have published and thought. Um, however, internal flow inside biofilm channels doesn't really affect the external shape, right? So um, here is a simulation of what happens with flow going through the, going through the biofilm and there's really no effect on this mushroom-like uh, features that we see in biofilms. So why, why do biofilms have channels? If it's not for flow, right? If the simulations say that flow doesn't really matter, um, one author has said that it's cell death. So cell death induces induced the forming of channels. All right. Um, we can also think though that we can probe a little bit deeper into this biofilm substructure. So the interior of the structure can be probed using electrochemical techniques. We're dealing with an electroactive biofilm. And we can probe that using cyclic voltometry and electrochemical impedance. Cyclic voltometry is shown on the left-hand side. It's where you sweep a voltage 
from one, one potential to another potential, and you measure the current. Um, from there, you can extract two things. You can extract the diffusion current and the formal potential. The formal potential is what happens at kind of the half maximum between the maximum current and the lowest current. We can also use electrochemical impedance where you, um, your goal is to, electrochemical impedance, one way to think about that is it's just a form of resistance, um, except it, it's a more generalized form of resistance. So we'll note that diffusion current seems to be a function of metabolic activity. So the graph on the left-hand side is that graph that I've been showing you of current versus time, which current being related to metabolic activity. And those points follow, the electron diffusion current seems to follow that very well. So no new information from there as we're trying to probe into this electrically conductive biofilm. Uh, so if we probe it using formal potential and equivalent circuit models, Right, so looking at an equivalent circuit of what that resistance should be on the right-hand side. So if I'm thinking of resist, generalized resistance, I can have a resistor in, in series with a, with a resistor and a constant phase element in parallel. Formal potential is very stable across shear, while charge transport resistance, on the other hand, that RCT seems to actually be pretty unstable with time. So those aren't things that I can extract enough information from if I'm trying to probe inside this biofilm and figure out what's going on, what's making the metab metabolic activity seem to really jump out. Um, so I can look and say that formal potential and charge transport are functions of adhered proteins on the electrode surface, right? So these are, yes, I was able to say that geobacter sulfur reducens, the organism that we were looking at, is really good at transporting electrons from inside of its cell to outside of its cell, right, to an electrode. But that, that last piece is dependent on one protein contacting my electrode, All right? I know that the activity of electron transport proteins is a function of local pH, that they start denaturing as you start dropping the pH. I know that the transport of protons from biofilm is really a function of depth, right? So that as you go deeper and deeper, you wind up in decreasing your pH as you go deep into the biofilm, All right? So both from the modeling work on uh, the paper from 2016, as well as from experimental results from the paper from 2009, right? I know that porosity in the biofilm is a function of depth, right? Both the measurements that I've taken, as well as the measurements um, done by uh, Van Wey in 2011, right? I know that the interior porosity of an electroactive biofilm is determined by the initial shear, right? So there's this porosity relationship. And so what you can take away from all that is that the porosity is really the thing dictating your electron transport. So if the question is electroactive microbial metabolism is slow, is this improved by convection of food or convection of waste or convection um, of momentum or both? What we can conclude is that metabolism, growth rate, and charge transport are improved by the convection of momentum, right? So that is, we've grown a little bit faster. Uh, we are metabolizing faster, but we've also changed the transport. The thickness and porosity are not functions of shear at the outside, but the biofilm structure and the porosity does remember the initial surface and flow conditions. And that there's an, there exists a trade-off between high metabolic rates and sustainability of this current output. So that's what you can really take away from this very long story of probing into the interior of a biofilm. Um, and so with that, um, I would talk a little about my future work. So looking at on electroactive bacteria, how does, char how does shears change the charge transport mechanisms? All right, so what exactly is changing as far as that those proton, proton, proteins are concerned? And then on filter design, does varying filter media and flow rate change the quantity and identity of known bacterium inoculum? Um, does varying the filter media and flow rate change protein and ATP production of a known bacteria inoculum? And can filter media be designed to really trap and release bad bacteria, quote unquote bad bacteria on demand, so that we don't release bad bacteria into our drinking water systems? Knowing this idea of shear stress impacting biofilm function, structure, metabolism, structure, and growth rates. Um, so just acknowledging the work, the agencies that funded this work, so the Limelson MIT program, the Alpha P. Sloan Foundation, um, and the Laboratory for Energy and Microsystems Innovation at MIT all funded um, the public, published work that I was talking about, and the Northeastern University Honors Program, uh, they're the ones that helped fund the work that went into the what later became a grant proposal. Um, looking at filters. So, yeah, as I said, I will take what.